All right, everybody. Let's get started. Welcome to RacketCon. I am very excited to be here. I hope all of you are just as excited. Um, where's everybody coming from? Anyone? Everyone here? Connecticut? All right. Atlanta. Yes, nice. Nice. Who's coming from the furthest away? California. All right, that's me. All right, awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I know some of you have traveled a long way to get here, so um, welcome. And for those of you watching on the live stream, welcome as well. And um, we're going to have a really exciting array of speakers here today for you. But first, I want to tell you about the name tags. Some of you may have noticed as you walked in that your name tags, in addition to having your name on them, also have a cryptic diagram. Now, this cryptic diagram is um, a game designed by the brilliant and creative mind of Robbie, our very own Robbie. <laughs> and it is in honor of our keynote speaker, Douglas Crockford, uh, because it is based on the JSON um, schema diagram that you find at json.org. And it's basically like, uh, you know, if you look at it, it's substrings that are connected by, uh, you know, the ones that come after have an arrow between them. And you have to linearize them to form the name of a person who is going to be your soulmate, your racket soulmate for the day. You're destined to meet this person. So sometime today, just, you know, meet everybody you can until you find the person you're fated to meet. Um, other things by way of announcements is if you drove here and you parked, you are going to need a parking pass. You can get that either from Robbie or from Wynant, who is sitting outside. And you'll need to put that in your car. And finally, there's no food or drinks allowed in this auditorium, unfortunately, as I learned, because I was the first person who brought that in, and I was told that it's not allowed. So um, you'd have to eat it outside. And um, also, I'd like to thank our patrons, our patron ticket holders, and um, our sponsor, Northwestern University. And uh, let me just name our patrons here. They are Jeff Noth, who is here in the audience, Stephen DeGabriel, who is watching on the live stream, and Thomas Zidzik. I'm not sure if you're on the live stream, but thank you. Um, and yeah, with that, I think we're ready to start. So we have a very exciting array of speakers here for you today. Starting with our keynote, Douglas Crockford, who um, is the creator of the JSON standard and also wrote the ever popular book, JavaScript, The Good Parts, and the new book, How JavaScript Works. And he is responsible for what is perhaps the first significant discovery of the 21st century, which is that JavaScript has good parts. Nobody knew that. Unlike Racket, which of course has only good parts, am I right? No, I'm just kidding. But, um, but yeah, without further ado, <laughs> we need racket, con racket the good parts, too. But uh, without further ado, let's give it up for Douglas. First, I have to turn everything on, just a moment. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Great. All right. Um, so uh, from here to Lambda and back again, I'm going to take you on a trip from the past into the future. So I'm going to start with this guy. This is Bertrand Russell, a 20th century mathematician. Here he is looking very old and very smart. Um, over 100 years ago, he wrote or co-wrote the uh, Principia Mathematica. And in it, he introduced a notation for a particular kind of variable, where the uh, variable wore a circumflex or a hat on top. This uh, influenced a few people, but apparently not too many, because most people aren't aware of this notation. But someone who was influenced was this guy, Alonzo Church an American mathematician who, two decades later, was writing a paper called A Set of Postulates for the Foundation of Logic. 
and he wanted to use Russell's notation. He liked the way the hat looked. But his printer couldn't do that, couldn't do the hats. So the printer convinced him that he could have a prefix instead. So reluctantly, he chose a prefix and asked, well, do you have anything that looks like a hat? And he says, well, we have this thing which looks like a hat with a feather on it. I go, OK. Uh, it, Turns out it's the Greek letter lambda, which I'm sure Church was aware of. And he continued using that notation for the rest of his career. Uh, he went on to invent what is now known as the lambda calculus. Had he not been forced to do this, it would probably be called the Church calculus. But uh, it didn't, so it's lambda calculus. Uh, this is John von Neumann. I couldn't find a picture of him looking old and smart because he died in his early 50s as a consequence of having worked on the atomic bomb in Los Alamos. But he was maybe the most important mathematician of the 20th century. Brilliant, brilliant man. He is perhaps best remembered, at least in our community, for having written the first draft of a report on the EDVAC, which uh, was the first expression of the von Neumann architecture. Uh, well, he, he wrote the paper all by himself. It was based on ideas from a lot of other people and his team. And they were all really upset that he just went and published this without giving that, any of them credit. So it was very controversial at the time. It was also controversial because uh, the EDSAC team had hoped to secure a bunch of patents. And they couldn't because von Neumann published before they were ready to file. And so. As a result, all of that stuff went into the public domain. So almost immediately after von Neumann's publication, there were dozens of projects all over the world developing von Neumann machines. And they all came up really quickly. And we went through an era of intense innovation and experimentation, which brought us to where we are now. This is John McCarthy looking very smart and very old. Uh, he was the creator of LISP, developed it at MIT in the early 50, or in the late 50s, early 60s. And it uh, did not get mainstream adoption, but is still an extremely important language. Uh, LISP stands for list processing. Uh, he borrowed an idea from IPL5, which was representing information in lists. He went a little further and decided that information could be represented more effectively in lists of lists. And so he invented the recursive data structure and uh, used recursive functions in order to manipulate those structures. It was originally designed to run on an IBM 704, which was a machine with 16-bit words. And in the A mode, a word contained an address field and a decrement field. And so in his little language, he put in operators for getting at those parts of a word. So the original design of Lisp was extremely hardware specific. Uh, but somehow we managed to get past that. Uh, he, his intention was to make it a kind of conventional algorithmic language, much like Algol. He was on the Algol 60 committee. And so it included a feature called prog, which let you write in S expressions something which looked fairly procedural. So you'd have a list of statements, including th this abomination. This is a go-to. Lisp had a go-to in it. Is anybody shocked by that? <laughs> yeah, uh, fortunately. The Lisp community did not adopt that strongly, and, and we moved past it. And it's lambdas all the way. Uh, he wrote lambda up there uh, because at the time, Lisp was practiced on punch cards. And punch cards were constrained to use the Hollerith code, which did not contain any Greek letters or lowercase letters. And so that's why programs look the way they did. That's why you had to type out the word lambda, even though it doesn't really mean anything. But um, apparently, there's still people doing this. It's amazing. This is Alan Kay, looking old and very smart. Uh, he designed the Smalltalk language. And the development of Smalltalk took almost a decade, where 
uh, they created a language and then did extensive testing of it and then took all the things they learned from that testing and made another. It's the best designed programming language in history. N nobody else took that much care. It's amazing work. So in 1971, he had, or, or I don't know when he had the epiphany, he, he saw Modula 67 and saw the objects in it and was inspired. He thought this was such an, an important idea that it could be put in a programming language for children, that it would be so expressive that children could program their own personal computers, which was kind of a radical notion in 1970. Uh, so he prototyped his language in 71 in BASIC on a mini computer and then started going around the country telling people about what he had done with this new language, that it was all about objects and was all about sending messages to objects. One of the places he visited was MIT, and he talked about his system and how it worked. And uh, one of the people at that meeting was Carl Hewitt, here looking old and very smart. And he listened to what Alan was saying and said, OK, well, you're not really sending messages. You are doing subroutine invocation within direction, which is brilliant. That's a really brilliant idea. But what if you actually were sending messages? And so he took that idea and ran with it and came up with what he called the actor model, where instead of objects, you have actors, and they do their work by sending messages to each other. And, uh, that replaces all the mechanisms we've had up until this point. We don't have subroutines anymore. It's all objects, or it's all actors. So Carl is one of these people who is amazingly smart. He was born on the other side of a paradigm shift. So when he talks, nobody understands what he means, because he's, he's seeing things from a completely different perspective. So two of the people at MIT who are also very smart uh, Guy Steele and, and, and uh, Gerald Sussman thought, what is Alan talking about? Because Alan wasn't actually making anything. He was just ranting and writing papers, but there was no demonstration that these actors actually worked. So they decided, well, let's, let's prove that Carl's full of shit. Let's try doing that. And so Carl had developed some earlier AI systems, the planner and the uh, conniver, so they decided to create something called the Schemer, which was uh, a little Lisp interpreter, which they would modify to implement what they understood Carl to be raving about. And as a result of doing that exercise, they accidentally invented Scheme, which I think is the most important advance so far in the history of programming, that having uh, first-class functions with closure and proper tail recursion, absolutely brilliant. And they found it by accident. Turns out they, they weren't the first to discover it. Um, uh, Peter Landon had been running around talking about this for years previously, but he was another of these guys who was on the other side of the paradigm shift. Nobody understood what he was talking about until after the scheme was discovered. Then it was, oh, yeah, that's what Peter was talking about. That's a, turns out that's a really good idea. And, Unfortunately, this still hasn't gone to the mainstream or any of its deserving successors. But what has gone mainstream is JavaScript. So uh, you may have heard that JavaScript has good parts. They came from Scheme. The good parts in JavaScript are schemish. And JavaScript could have been the language which would have delivered functional programming to the world, but it didn't happen. So we can look at the uh, the paradigms of software development up until this point, starting with the von Neumann architecture, which von Neumann did, where you programmed machines basically in octal. You, you figure out the numeric codes and put the numeric codes on cards, and they go directly into the machine, into memory. Uh, Grace Hopper and others got us into symbolic programming, where we start for the first time using computers to help us write programs for computers. Uh, that leads to high-level languages. The first big winner is Fortran, but there are lots and lots of others. 
uh, the next step forward is structured programming uh, with uh, Pascal and C and uh, Algol 60. Uh, then object-oriented programming, which you may have heard of, that became a really big deal. And then finally, functional programming. Unfortunately, we haven't finished this one. We're still stuck on the object-oriented programming. We should have gotten to functional programming at least a generation ago. We're two, de two decades behind on this. I'm really depending on you to, to move the ball because we're losing. We're, we're not making progress the way we should. We think of our profession as being extremely innovative, but we can't do the next obvious thing, which uh, I think is frustrating. Generally, each of these takes about a generation to accomplish because each represents a paradigm shift and you, it's very difficult to teach a paradigm shift. You have to experience a paradigm shift and getting people to that stage is really difficult and really expensive and most people don't do it. So the way we make progress is we wait for a generation to retire or die, and then we can take the students and, and move them forward. And we've done that until we got to object-oriented programming, and then we stopped, and we're just stuck in that, and we, we've lost the ability to go forward. The thing that all of these have in common is that the program runs in a single machine. This is a consequence of everything we've done built on a theory developed by Turing and Church, uh, where it's all happening in a machine without I.O. Now, we, we kind of broke the Lambda model by introducing I.O., uh, but we really want to go distributed, and the Lambda model doesn't have a way of describing, and this next step depends on something happening in another machine. You, you can't say that in the Lambda calculus. So the next, so, uh, Lambda doesn't apply to distributed systems, so we need to go forward into the next paradigm, which is secure distributed programming. This is what the world needs, because we're already doing this, but we lack the tools for doing it effectively, and so we're doing a really bad job of it. In particular, our systems are wildly inefficient and wildly insecure, and so we hear about uh, mishaps and intrusions all the time. So, I think the solution uh, is the actor model, that the stuff that Carl was raving about, that uh, scheme was invented to try to disprove, is actually the right thing, and, and it is what should direct us into the, the next paradigm. It's a simple model, uh, and the thing that's especially attractive about it to me is that the concurrency model, the communication model, and the securing model are all the same thing. If you're doing it correctly, you get all three of these at once. And so you're, it's a lot less effort than trying to do distributed programming in the current models. So actor models are finally starting to become popular, uh, but there's also a lot of misunderstanding about what an actor model is, and so there are things calling themselves actors which may or may not be actors. So this is my understanding of what is required for an actor model. So first, a program is running in a single process in a machine. That's what an actor is. An actor communicates with other actors only by message passing. There is no sharing even between actors in the same machine. An actor can create new actors in its own machine. Every actor has a private address. By private address, I mean it is unguessable. So the only way you can get an address is by some secure means. If you have an actor's private address, you can send messages to that actor. And if you don't have it, you can't. And messages can contain private actor or private addresses, and actors can have state, which can change based on received messages. So there are a lot of things claiming to be actors. If they don't fulfill all of these, they are not. There is something else. Now there are other things that can be in an actor system that I recommend but are not required. So incoming messages are queued if necessary and delivered in delivery order. 
an actor will not be given another message until it is done with the previous message. Messages sent by an actor will be held until it is done. And an actor's turn may be time sliced. This is important because if an actor turns out to be computationally heavy, uh, we can suspend it and allow other actors in the same machine to run. Uh, the other approach is to have a watchdog timer which will kill the actor, but that can prevent useful things from getting finished. If we don't have the watch time, if we don't do the time slicing, then a single actor can take down the whole system. So the thing that makes actor systems secure are the rules of acquisition of private addresses. Uh, there are four ways in which you can get an address. By creation. When an actor creates a new actor, it receives that actor's address. By construction, an actor can be endowed with private addresses when it is created. By introduction, an actor can receive messages containing private addresses. And uh, for bootstrapping, we have a portal, which I'll demonstrate in a minute. So I recommend to, to go with the new paradigm, a new set of languages. Uh, strictly speaking, a new language isn't necessary, but I think a language is necessary for thinking properly. For example, uh, C++ uh, had two paradigms in it. It had the object-oriented programming and the old structured uh, paradigm in it. And it was difficult for people to reason effectively about objects, and still is, because you could program in Fortran style in C++. And so I want a language which makes it easier to think properly about the new paradigm. So uh, an actor language should promote uh, good design patterns. Actors should have strong cohesion, where each actor has a limited role. It does one thing and does it really effectively. They have loose coupling because they share nothing. They communicate only by messaging. Uh, they should be concise. So often in object systems, they are extremely chatty where you're uh, doing a whole bunch of setters before you actually ask for some work to be done, or even worse, changing uh, public members. You don't want to do that kind of stuff in actors. You want to send everything that an actor needs in a single message. And you want it to be robust, because we have distributed systems, and we now have more points of failure. So being able to keep programs and systems running effectively and reliably in the face of that potential for failure is very important. And it's not something that's adequately provided by the current languages. So there are two approaches to these languages. One is a transitional approach, and the other is actors all the way down. Uh, that comes from a model of cosmology in which the world rests on the back of an enormous turtle. And you ask, well, what is the turtle standing on? And the answer is another turtle. You know, what is he standing on? It's turtles all the way down. So we can do the same thing with actors, where everything is an actor. And I'm aware of two projects that we're trying to do this in hardware. One is uh, Dale Schumacher's U-Fork. Um, I don't like the name because it sounds like it might be a curse word or, or wants to. Um, but it's a really clever architecture in which the basic machine instruction is a message sent. Um, I'm very optimistic about that. Carl Hewitt was working on his own uh, system called ActorScript, which was also going to have a, a hardware implementation, which would have been amazing. But unfortunately, uh, Carl passed away last year. And I don't think that work is going to continue. So that's doing actors all the way down. But I, and I think ultimately that's the right way to do it. But I instead want to go with a transitional approach because industry likes little steps. When you offer the industry a big step, even if it's a rational, logical, proven step, they won't take it. That's why C++ beat small talk. Um, so hopefully the, the next transitional language to actors will not be as crappy as C++. Uh, so my plan is to take the best of current practice and then add an expansion kit to get us the actor capability. And I'm going to start with JavaScript. Because JavaScript has good parts. So I'm going to take just the good parts, which are 
flexible objects, which are brilliant. They're much better, in my view, than, than Khan's trees, because uh, while they use more memory, they are much faster and much easier to use. And uh, the first class functions with, with closure, which is vitally important. I, I want to carry uh, that idea from scheme forward. And JavaScript is already optimized for event handling. And if you're competent at event handling, you're way ahead, because events are messages. And if you can think of event, han event handlers as actors, you're kind of partially already into that paradigm. Uh, but JavaScript has lots of bad parts. And reasonable people can argue about what the bad parts are, but trust me, I'm right. Uh, <laughs> it, it's all pretty much bad, and so we're, we're not using any of that. So I, I call this the MISTI system because it's totally vaporware. Uh, but you know, maybe someday I'll get it. Uh, my intent is really not to try to sell you a language, but to try to sell somebody the idea that they can take the stuff I'm about to talk about and do it better, which I think is likely. Um, so I'm going to add a send uh, statement, which can take either a private address or a message. And it will take uh, something which is like a JSON object, which represents a message, and send it to that address or as a reply to that message. And there's uh, additional forms which take callbacks, which say, and this message can take a reply. And if a reply comes, it'll be delivered to that callback. You can also register a receiver function, which receives all of the messages which are not being delivered to callbacks. And you can register a portal function, which is part of the bootstrapping system. So MISTI will be uh, cleaner, module, modular, functional, uh, have message sending and receiving. It'll have blobs, because blobs are important for representing things like uh, public keys and, and encrypted secrets. It'll have failure management, which is really important, and no exceptions. I, th I think exceptions turned out to be problematic, particularly in systems that are doing threading. You can have two cooperating threads, which are tightly coupled through memory, and one of them throws an exception, and so it rewinds its stack a little bit, and now those threads are out of sync with each other and can lead to cascading failures. I have an Android TV set. I think this is happening in there. So about once a month, I have to pull the plug out of the wall and reset it, because somehow something happens. And, and when, these, when you have exception-caused bugs, they are extremely difficult to debug, which is why I'm still pulling the plug on my TV set. So um, I'm going to, uh, not a real demonstration, but a, a fake demonstration now for you the theater of computation. So this guy here is a worker. He is an actor. And his job is to get work done. He's really important. Uh, he's so important that we don't want to expose him to the outside. So he doesn't talk to clients. He just does his work. And he creates an agent. And his agent will stand between him and the world. So he. The actor creates the agent, and by doing that, it gets the agent's address. And in creating the agent, it gave the agent its own address. So the white arrow indicates that each has the address of the other, so they can send messages to each other. Meanwhile, on another machine, the dotted line represents a machine boundary. So you can think of that as being a network. Or it could be on the same machine. You don't know or care. There's a client, and it wants to talk to the actor. And it has the address of the client, or of the agent. And so it wants to ask the agent for access to the worker. So he does that by sending a message. So if you have the address of an actor, you can send a message to it. And the message will ask for, for an introduction. Now, the agent doesn't want to give the address of the worker to others. It's his job to protect the worker. 
And so he creates a liaison. And he gives the liaison the address of the worker. And he sends a, a reply back to the client containing the liaison's address. So now the client has the address of the liaison. So he can now send messages to the liaison. The liaison can then forward them to the worker. But that's not the client's job. So the, the client creates a minion. And he gives the address to the minion. And now the minion can send a message to the liaison. And the liaison can inspect the message, make sure that it conforms to policy, that it doesn't ask the worker anything that this party shouldn't be able to ask for. Um, and if it decides that the uh, message is OK, and it can modify the message if it needs to, it can then forward it to the worker. OK? Now, there might be another machine which has another minion that needs to talk to the worker. And the agent could let them both use the same liaison. But instead, it creates a liaison for each one, because actors are cheap. And so there's not much cost in making another one. And each one can be specialized for enforcing the particular policy for that particular party. Also, it allows for revocation. So if the agent decides to cut someone off, it can send a message to one of the liaisons saying, stop forwarding all messages. And that cuts the other one off. It also gives us some accountability that if one of these minions uh, leaks the address to some other party, we know that he's the leaker. So when we started, the client had the private address of the agent. But how do you know that? If it's a private address, how, how do you have that? So there's some bootstrapping that we need to do. So to accomplish that, well, let's go back a little bit farther. So we're in this situation. The agent knows that it needs for people to connect somehow so that they can get the services of the worker. So it creates a portal. A portal is a special flavor of actor that can have a public address. So we can take that public address and we can publicize it. We can put it in contracts. We can put it on QR codes. We can put it on Google. We can make it easy to find. Uh, so the client, if he has the portal's network address and the portal's public key, can connect to the portal. And at the same time, it can be providing credentials. It can provide its own public key. It could provide uh, all of the other ridiculous security things that we're doing now, like uh, username and password and uh, 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 signed certificates and all that other crap. It can do that too. And at that point, the portal can check all of those things and decide, yes, this guy's OK. And if he is OK, then he will send back a message containing the address of the portal. And now he's able to communicate. So again, concurrency, communication, and security all come from the same thing. So uh, the kind of security that's practiced in actor systems is called capability systems. And capabilities are starting to become popular. And there are a lot of things that are calling themselves capability systems now, which aren't. Uh, because there's some people who seem to think that capability is a synonym for good. And so if they call their systems capability systems, then people think they're good, even if they're not capability systems, really, even if they're not good, really. Um, so. You can only communicate with actors if you have the address for the actor. And this is called uh, unguessability. Uh, you can make stand-in actors that lack the power of the star actors. This is called attenuation. We, we saw this with the uh, liaison. Private addresses can be sent to actors. That means that they're transferable. Uh, we only give out act, uh, addresses to actors that have the least power that can satisfy the intended objective, that is the principle of least authority. 
If you don't have all of these things in your security system, it's not a capability system. So robustness is really important because we have so many points of failure. And reasoning about distributed points of failure is really hard. Um, reasoning about reliability is generally hard, which is why our systems are not as reliable as they should be. It turns out it's easier to reason about a program when it is starting up. That's the best time to think about a program, because then you know exactly what it's going to do next. And it is harder to reason about a program when it is failing unexpectedly. So the idea that we can uh, catch an unexpected failure and fix it with an exception handler, I think, is misguided. That I think we have proven that that doesn't work. So what we need to do instead is borrow an idea from Erlang. Uh, Erlang was brilliant in giving us the idea that we should have death before confusion. If we have an element of software which is determined to not be working correctly, it should die. And in the actor model, I think we can take this much further. So uh, here we have a network of workers. This is the worker that we saw earlier this morning. And these are all of the other workers that are working for it. So it, it's really you know, upper management at this point. It doesn't actually do anything itself, but it has all these other things which are making it look good. Unfortunately, this guy here gets con confused and fails. You go, oh no. So what happens? Well, uh, he can't receive messages anymore, so he gets garbage collected. His supervisor gets informed that that worker died, so he just restarts it, and everything's good. So the system recovered. Now suppose later uh, the supervisor fails. Okay, this is a, a bigger thing because there are more dependencies on him. So immediately his direct subordinates fail. And their subordinates fail. And they get garbage collected. And this manager gets informed that this calamity just happened. So uh, he could restart them or he realizes this, I can't, it's too complicated. So he fails. And his other subordinates fail. And so they get garbage collected. And the worker is informed of this. And he goes, oh, OK. So we'll restart that manager. And he'll restart his supervisors. And they'll restart their actors. And life is good again. So. In my TV set, the most reliable fix is to turn the power off and on. And that turns out to, to work universally, generally. And this allows us to turn the power off and on at a much finer scale and to also do it in distributed systems, which it's really hard to coordinate. OK, everybody uh, turn it off and on at the same time. With actor systems, we can get that benefit without that complexity. Maybe the most important part of the actor model, which is something I'm not going to talk about today, is the protocol. Uh, I've implemented a proposal for the, for the transport layer of the protocol, which is called SAFE. Um, but there's lots more to do. Um, uh, there uh, needs to be a message format, which uh, I just developed, and uh, then a, a message uh, a protocol layer, which uh, is still left to do. So uh, the message format obviously wants to be JSON, right? Because it, it works. And uh, the things that are loose about JSON makes it really easy to have distributed systems. Because every, um, because things are made of objects generally, and the objects are unordered. And if you ask for a property that isn't there, you can get a null value, which tells you it's not there, and you can deal with it. So uh, dealing with things that are at different version levels can work. It's backward and forward compatible, or you can build things that are such. And that's really important in building distributed systems, particularly if they're going to be multi-party systems. That in an actor system, it shouldn't matter what language you're written in. Um, you know, beyond a, 
all, you're just talking to a network and you're getting bits. So one thing could be written in MISTI, another thing could be written in Racket, and nobody knows or cares, it all works because you got this JSON level. Um, unfortunately, JSON doesn't quite do it because JSON doesn't have blobs, and I really need blobs in order to make this work. So I've developed a new notation which keeps what I think are all the good parts of JSON and abandons the bad parts that I, that I put into JSON and adds the blobs that I need and a couple other things. And I call it Nota, and you can read about it at uh, crockford.com. So that is the uh, theater of computation. I think this is the next paradigm. And I'm working on a language that'll help us get there. I'm sure there are other people who could also develop a language which might be more effective or, or more likely get finished before mine does. I've been working on mine for going on 50 years. Um, and every time I encounter a new idea, I go, you know, uh, so. I, I don't promise that I'll, I'll get there with you, but I think this is the next place we need to go. So with that, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy for the invitation, very happy to see all of you. Uh, thank you and good night. All right, so we have time for questions. The way the questions are gonna work, since this is the first time we're doing this today, is there is a microphone that's been set up here in the aisle for live attendees, or in-person attendees, rather. Um, so if you could just form a line here and ask your question, that would be great. And for people who are watching the live stream, if you can post your questions as comments on the feed, I will be able to look at them and um, forward them on to Douglas. So. Works better when you turn it on. Thank you so much for this talk. This was really interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask, you were talking about when an actor goes down, its subordinates go down, and its supervisor starts it up again. How do you deal with network partitioning? Because I could easily see you end up with multiple sub-networks trying to do the same thing. Uh, yeah, that, that's one of the classic problems. You can't tell the difference between something being delayed, or the network failing, or a nuclear strike on the other end. <laughs> They, at the moment, they are all indistinguishable. And so the only way you can cope with that is to have a common mechanism. Um, so uh, some years ago, uh, in 2001, I was developing a framework for doing uh, applications delivered in web pages, which has become a popular thing now. But in 2001, not many people were daring to do that. And there we had a, a simpler partition problem. We just had a, a browser and a server. But they could get out of sync. Things could get weird. And we figured out a recovery mechanism, which was no matter what goes wrong, for what reason, refresh the page. And that always worked. That would, it, if it was possible to recover, that would recover. And even if the, the server recognizes we're out of sync, I don't know what to do, he sends a message to the browser saying, refresh the page. And that would take everything back to a clean state, and then we could go from there. And um, I'm convinced that that's going to work in actor systems as well. Right, but that doesn't cover the case where you now have two sub-networks trying to do the same job. Like you've got two people trying to process a given set of data so something gets processed twice or well, eventually there's going to be some actor who's aware that both things are going on okay and at that point you can shut everything down again okay all right thank you hello and uh, ditto thank you for the talk i um wanted to know more about how organizational politics meets with actor models. So if you have two departments, each has their own actor-driven system, and they both don't fail, but they produce results that are not actually compatible with each other. Uh, how, have you re uh, how does that work? How do you fix that problem? I don't think that's a software problem. I think yeah, it's a communication problem, problem absolutely. Yeah. But it's more of a, when you have a communication problem and you can't reboot the actors, what does it look like? Do you create another system just to patch the other two that are there? Or 
like how do you see that getting reconciled internally? I'm sorry, I, I, I can't get my head around the question. Sure, so um, I guess one example I could give you is you have, I've encountered a situation where you have a QA department and an engineering department, but for internal political reasons, they're actually not communicating effectively and would produce work that's actually incompatible with each other. So one of the tasks I would normally do is try to help them reconcile whatever interface is missing so that they can start working again. But if I were to reframe those kind of conflicts in my head, I see QA with its own actor system. I see engineering with its own actor system. They're both functioning. Neither are failing, but they're producing data that's not helpful. Would my job be to create a new actor system specifically for reconciliation so that they can be whatever they want? Or If you can't correct their behavior, mm -hmm. then yeah. So you'd have a, a bridge actor that would, or a translator actor that would sit between them and, and adapt. How would you, and this is more of a second part, but how would you reconcile the problem of actors proliferating in this way? Because communication problems are everywhere on account of, I, I'm worried that actors would proliferate to the point that people wouldn't understand the working ones either. I, again, I can't get my head around that. Uh, okay, but um, I think the bridge actor answers my question adequately. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. We have a comment from an online poster that says, uh, will this ever be usable in high performance computing uh, since the abstractions uh, cannot be compiled away at a system level? Um, so, so the thing that UFORC is working on is doing message sending at the hardware level so it can go very fast. But uh, the other way to think about this is there are two components broadly for determining the performance of a system. One is how much time it takes to do the, this when you're running, and the other is how much time you spend waiting. And I've seen a lot of cases where people are trying to optimize their running time when they're spending 90% of their time waiting. And generally in distributed systems, Everything's depending on the network, and those latencies are all unknown. Uh, you might be able to make predictions, but generally you don't know how long something's going to take. And so figuring out a way of getting stuff working effectively, reducing the latencies as much as possible, trying to get the wait times down, is the way to make systems go faster if you want to be effective. And actors are really good at that because you can do things like an actor needs the work of several other actors in order to continue. It can distribute those work requests simultaneously, right? So they all go out, all of those are running on different machines, and so they're all working in parallel. Um, so the results come back faster. Uh, you need a little bit of smarts for dealing with that, and. Uh, the MISTI language will have that. It's something I've already written or demonstrated in JavaScript called uh, Parsec, which manages requests done in parallel and, and, and sequences. And when you have that, you can significantly reduce your waiting time, and that's going to make your systems much higher performance. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned taking inspiration from Erlang for failure handling, yeah. but I couldn't help wondering through, through your talk how you're positioning Erlang in the space. Do you view it as an actor system? Um, what are the good or bad parts of Erlang, I guess? And so there's a lot of goodness in, in Erlang. I have a lot of respect for Erlang. Erlang is not, in my view, an actor system because it's using process IDs as actor addresses, and those are entirely guessable. Right? If you know your own actor ID, you might imagine, well, let's do plus one of me and plus two of me and so on. You can discover actors that way that does not have the security that we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are actors microservices done well or done right or some better version, some completely independent idea, what do you see as the relationship? Yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> if that's what it takes to sell them, then yeah, they're, they're the good microservices. 
Microservices, the good parts. Yeah. Well, uh, I just want to say that this is a fascinating um, look at the history of computation. And, um, you know, they say that those who forget the lessons of history are condemned to repeat the mistakes of the past. Uh, so maybe the, the inverse is true as well, that knowing the lessons of history will help us see trends that are going to be beneficial in the future. So if, I hope this is that. Um, so if there are no further questions, then we can take it to the break. We will reconvene here at 10.30 for the next talk. Um, so yeah, let's give it up again. Oh, actually, do we have a question? Yes, John, <laughs> come up to the microphone, please. Right, try, try, try. Um, so, so one of the foundational, sorry for not having a wealth, this, thank you so much. I, it was a wonderful talk. Um, your talk is founded on the idea of paradigms. Um, and, and so I just, I guess I just want to ask a very vague question um, about whether paradigms are really important. I know that, you know, uh, Shriam has this, Krishnamurti has this, you know, the computing in a post linnaean world and the, and the idea that maybe, you know, it's not so important to be focused on a single paradigm or a single idea. But, but this is clearly, you're, you're on the paradigm train. Um, can you comment on that at all? But yeah, so my view of paradigms is historical. So you look at the difference between Fortran and Pascal. Not a huge difference, right? Um, but it, I don't, you might, rem were you around for that? I was around for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe a little bit. I did a little bit of Pascal. It, yeah, I did, I did Pascal. It was really in, in fractious. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, Fortran the Fortran guys would, were not having it. They said, you can't take GoTo away from us. We need it. It's an essential tool. You're, we're giving up control. Performance is going to suffer. We can't optimize that Pascal stuff the way we can optimize the Fortran because we don't have GoTo's. Um, were they right? No, it turned out <laughs> they were completely wrong. So what happened was about 20 years later, we looked around and asked, are they gone? <laughs> yeah, they're gone? OK, good. Let's just stop using go-tos, and everything was fine. Um, and all of the threats they made about how the world was going to end and, and get slower uh, never happened. It's a tiny step, right, from go-to to not go-to. But it took 20 years. A similar thing happened with objects that there were people who just couldn't understand objects, that they added too much uh, uh, inefficiency, that you're, the indirections and the V tables and all that crap is slowing us down. We, you know, we can't afford it. It's, we just can't afford it. And that turned out to be wrong. And, and there's a similar argument about functions, although in the functions it tends not to be a performance argument because they don't understand functions well enough to make the performance argument. It's more a people aren't meant to, to work with functions because it's too complicated and, and people can't count. And, and you need to, you know, balancing the parents, it's, it's impossible. <laughs> uh, again, but you know, it turns out parents are, are orthogonal to the benefits of functional programming, right? Uh, but we can't get past it. And even though, uh, we managed to get functions into JavaScript, and that inspired some of the other dinosaur languages to adopt it. I mean, even C++ has, has functions now. Uh, we're not using them effectively. So we haven't completed that paradigm shift. Um, and it's just because it's hard to teach a paradigm shift. You can go and talk about the benefits of structured programming and you know, make claims about how uh, the code's going to be more readable and, and more maintainable, but you're talking to guys who say, what are you saying about my code? Uh, you know, and they take it personally and, and don't really hear what you're saying. They don't understand the benefit because they think they already have the benefit, that you're just talking to people who don't have the talents that they have or, or whatever. They'll, they'll come up with all sorts of rationalizations for why 
what you're saying doesn't make sense or is not important to them. Uh, but it turns out it is. And so that's why the paradigm shifts take so long. And without taking that step, we don't make progress. John is not asking about a paradigm shift as a paradigm. He's asking about a scientific philosophy here. Do paradigms exist? And uh, I, I'll take you up on that. For, um, so give, give me a moment, right? Uh, Fortran. You talk about old Fortran. John happened to be in the Fortran Department of Computer Science <laughs> for his PhD. And they didn't care about this. What he experienced was that Fortran existed in Java. The first Java program I saw was 10,000 lines in one main function. Yep. And it was optimized, amazing, right? And when I see Java programs in industry, they still look like Fortran for some value of Fortran. Yep. Uh, what you talked about existed around 1971 when Carl Ewitt saw the, actum, saw the, uh, um, saw the uh, small talk idea. So we are not looking at paradigms that exist, that all coexist all the time. And we don't know how to do it. And you actually, you, your own model has a philosophical flaw. The portal is shared memory. Whether you call it shared memory or not, doesn't matter. But you don't have a clean paradigm either in that sense. And so what John really asked about is other paradigms. And I think that's, that's the critical thing that we talked about your talk. You have zero, one, two, three, four. You call it fifth, but it's really sixth paradigm because you started zero. And they're not, really, they're not really paradigms with clean shifts. They're overlapping, they're interacting, they talk to each other. And your own idea with a portal shows that there's sharing. And I can give you a lot more about actors who are sharing after the talk. But that, that's what we're getting at here. It's not clear whether your paradigm idea exists. Sorry, it was a comment, it was not a question. Okay, clearly we're saying very different things when we say paradigm, and, and that's fine. I'm, I'm coming from a different perspective, perhaps even from a different paradigm. <laughs> we, we doubt Thomas Kuhn. Uh, we have another question. Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, so the principle of death before confusion, would that be something enforce at a very low level or something that a programmer could like configure like that they want like a specific actor to like not uh, have that actor or their actor's children uh, follow that protocol like for example for debugging purposes. Right, so uh, uh, in MISTI there's a fail statement. Um, so if you're going along and things are, it, maybe analogous to a, a uh, throw statement, but it's a fail statement. You don't say why it failed. Perhaps before doing that, you'll send a message to a log or something to explain, you know, goodbye, cruel world, and <laughs> I have to end it now. Uh, going up, that uh, uh, fail statement could be caught um, by a failure handler. Um, if it's not, then it will shut down and a message will be sent to its master. And it, if that actor had a suicide pact with other actors, they will be told to die as well. So, you know, if you have a bunch of actors with mutual dependencies and, you know, we all go together, then they will go at that time as well. So how is that different from exceptions? Uh, Exceptions are easily abused. Uh, they turned out to be a form of computed go-to, and they're also used as a uh, escape from the type system. So uh, very often, exceptions are used for things which are not really exceptional, uh, which are actually routine, but are not accommodated by the type system. And there's also the problem that I cited earlier where if you have two threads that are tightly coupled and one of them has an exception, then they may get out of sync. Thank you. Okay, we're just about out of time for questions, but I just wanted to highlight something you said earlier about the reason why C++ won out over languages like Smalltalk that were much better designed. 
um, is the same reason why JavaScript seems to have won out over other languages that are more functionally pure, like Haskell and so on, in the mainstream. And so um, I think that observation is a valuable one that more programming language ecosystems should probably take to heart to see that it's not just important to have good ideas, but we need to have a path to adoption through um, incremental stages. That's yeah, a valuable I, point. I wish that weren't the case, but historically it, it seems to be the case. All right, let's give it up for Douglas, everyone. Yeah.